All right, everybody, welcome to Unscripted, one-on-one -on -one and uh, reunion of sorts today, I guess you would say. Um, today, my guest is uh, Dave Parsons, and I'll let Dave introduce himself, tell us a little bit about him, uh, what he does, and, and uh, we'll go from there. Well, thanks for having me on, Aaron. Um, I know this has been a, a newer undertaking for you. Um, I, I've really been a fan of uh, following along with what you've done since we, we met when you were in college. I think you were a junior, I was a freshman, and you were kind enough to take me under your wing a little bit. And I think I may have had a chance over the years to tell you a little bit, but I mean, I really appreciated that back then. You were well-established at Mount Vernon Nazarene. Um, you hung out with a bunch of really fun people. Um, when you come in as a freshman, you've, all, you've gone from the top of the totem pole in high school to all of a sudden now you're down to being the lowly freshman again. And, and it's not always an easy experience. And um, going to a smaller private college, um, I wasn't Nazarene background, so I knew no one there. I really knew no one there. And um, you and your group of friends really took me in. I, I was the oldest of four kids, and so I'd never had like an older brother. But I always kind of felt like you were kind of my older brother that first year, especially. Um, and so I really appreciate that. And and I know you'd probably say that you were still wild crazy and all those kind of things then, and things have settled down for you since then. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you were just, you were a good influence on my life. And, and it's been fun to watch, like since college, um, you were real active with a blog for a little while there. And as somebody who does a lot of writing for work, I always try to read people who write well. Mm -hmm. And I know your story a little bit and you kind of, talk about how your grades weren't always the best and you got a pretty low ACT score and things like that. But your heart somehow comes through really well. And maybe you've picked up a lot of grammar stuff along the way because you write really well. And as somebody that writes for a living kind of, or at least did a lot of writing for a living for 21 years as a college sports information director, um, it was just really good to read the things you wrote. You, uh, you definitely connected with people. And so I've enjoyed following along with that. And then when I saw the podcast has come along, um, that's just an interesting way to connect with people in a different way. You don't have to spend quite as much time writing and proofreading. Now you just have to watch for bloopers with dogs coming on the screen and things like that. But uh, everybody's used to that now with all the Zoom calls. But um, no, so I met Aaron, gosh, that was back in the fall of 1990. Yeah. Yeah. 30 years ago. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> We're old. We are. Aaron had hair then. I know. I had a mullet. It was sweet. <laughs> and he was, he was the, I think he was the twin brother. He could be the doppelganger for uh, Vanilla Ice back then. So <laughs> there, right. There's what you can picture. Um, yeah, I own that. I own that. I really did. <laughs> but anyway, we, we met at Mount Vernon Nazarene and um, I actually, I, I graduated from MVNU. It was MVNC at the time. Um, with a degree in business and sports management and then stuck around as a college sports information director for 21 years and uh, had a lot of fun doing that. It was, it was great working in college athletics. You meet a lot of great people. I got to travel to a lot of fun places because our teams always did well. They still do well. Um, we had great coaches, uh, great support of people. Um, parents always seem to come to all their kids' games. And, and honestly, watching that was what made me consider making a career choice um, because as my girls were getting older and I have two girls um, and Ashley the oldest was about to go into eighth grade and I thought if I ever want to watch them play sports I can't really be covering all these sports for other people's kids and so yeah. I need to think about maybe some kind of career change where I'm not working every night and working double digit hours on Saturdays. I mean, it was, it was great being at MVNU because we didn't have games on Sundays. And so you always knew you had Sunday that you could schedule things. You basically have to get some work caught up just because my job was just a lot of hours. Um, but I really enjoyed what I did. It was great to be there. Um, but I just, I wanted to be able to watch my own kids do their things. And um, whether it was band, whether it was choir, art, sports, whatever they were going to do, I wanted to do that. So I made a switch and just started sending out some feelers. And um, I, I like certain reality TV shows and um, Undercover Boss is one of those shows that, um, you know, it's fairly unscripted. I've found out it might, I mean, it, it's unscripted from the business's standpoint, but like any of the reality shows, they can decide to make who the hero and the villains are, whether it's The Bachelor or Survivor or anything, how they piece it all together. But 
Donato's Pizza was on Undercover Boss about seven and a half years ago. And that was one of the shows I always liked from a business standpoint to see how people would handle the different situations. And, and so I remember watching Donato's. I was like, gosh, I love their pizza. And now you're seeing a little bit about their culture. So um, Jim Grody founded the company back in 1963. His daughter, Jane, who's now the executive chairwoman, um, she was the person that was on Undercover Boss. And uh, it's pretty hard to disguise a six foot blonde woman that everybody in the company knows, but they did that. It was kind of a ridiculous looking disguise, but that's kind of part of the gig with that. And so, yeah. so she was on there and um, I just really liked the way that she handled the different surprises, even down to uh, she got sent on a delivery driver episode where the delivery driver admitted to smoking pot with customers when he had some downtime. And that was a challenge because the undercover boss producers were trying to get her to get really upset about it right then and like fire him on the spot. And I think some people probably would have. Um, but here, you know, I've, I've learned the culture, especially after being here now for almost seven years. Um, it's about loving people and trying to do what's best for them. And what's best for that guy was number one, getting home safely that night because who knows what he'd done earlier in the evening. Um, number two, then trying to get him some help and maybe get him to make some better choices and, and things like that. So instead of firing him, they kept him around and put a lot of restrictions on him. He wasn't delivering anymore, those kind of things. And, and so that's whenever that episode re-airs, we get lots of things back. And that's the one part people remember is the guy that smoked pot with customers. Um, right. But I just, I learned a lot about the company and thought, you know, that might be an interesting place to consider because number one, I love their pizza. So if I have to sell it, it's an easy thing for me to sell um, yeah. because basically I was in sports marketing, sports PR. And so to transition to something else, I probably would have to sell something. So pizza seemed a lot better than catheters <laughs> right? Absolutely. Or funeral plots or who, who knows what. So, sure. <laughs> so I sent a resume and um, there really wasn't an open position. It was just one of those things that I'm not having to look for a job. That's a good situation to be in. Um, and I got to come in for an interview and then it went for a while and I thought, well, maybe they were just doing me a favor. Um, and, and eventually it came down to, I came back in for a couple more interviews and all the things on, they had a position finally, and it was a field marketing position. And there was a bunch of acronyms on there. I didn't know what any of them stood for. I mean, you think about MVNU and we had acronyms for every building, whether it's the MPB, the DRC, right. the okay. FEBC, and yeah. All of a sudden, here's all these strange acronyms that I don't even know what they are. And I'm like, I got to go back and do some research. There were like 21 things. And the last one was relates with people. And they're like, well, you know how to do that. We think we can teach you the other things. And I thought that's kind of a cool way to look at it. And so eventually I got offered a job there. I might have been their third or fourth choice. Who knows? It doesn't really matter. Um, yeah. But I got hired as a field marketing manager and, and did that for four years. And now for two and a half years, um, after my boss at the time retired, um, after being the PR person here for 24 years, now I handle the PR for this company and, and, and also oversee social media. And, and it's kind of like back to my role at MVNU where I was sports PR and social media there. And so it's a little bit bigger scale yeah. <laughs> um, when you have 165 stores in 10 states plus a bunch more locations, nearly 80 locations with Red Robin that are selling our pizza. And um, it's just been really fun to be part of the growth here and, and to be in a position where um, I'm growing in my field, I feel like. Um, they're teaching me new things every day. I have a new boss who's awesome. And um, it, you know, when she came here, the word was that she's really good at growing her people. Well, that's a great thing to have said about you. 100%. Um, and it's been evident in just the four months that she's been here. Um, you know, she's challenged me in really good ways. Like, you know, if you don't have the right attitude, you could go in and be like, oh man, more work to do. No, it's been fun because to think that at almost 49 years of age, I want to continue to learn. My parents were both school teachers. So I've always been kind of ingrained with this lifelong learning kind of thing. And so to have the opportunity to have a boss that's teaching me now in good ways to develop more and to be able to handle more and to do things, it's, it's exciting. So it's fun. Wow. There, there's a lot. Of, there's Yeah. Sorry. Oh, awesome. Uh, and as you were talking, I'm thinking, man, there's, there's like five different things that we could, this is like almost like five podcasts in one, uh, <laughs> because there's a lot of things I want to, I want to talk to you about. And 
first of all, that's, that's awesome. I mean, anytime, and you can see that in, 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 in anyone that watches this will see it visually. Anyone that listens to this will probably hopefully hear it, the excitement in your voice. And oh, I, yeah. I mentioned this on other podcasts, you know, I think for, for people to find a job where they actually love what they do, man, that comes through. Like, it's really hard to find, especially in today's economy where, where a lot of us are just, you know, there's so many people that are just trying to find a job at this point and right. to find one that you really love. And you've, you've clearly hit your sweet spot. Um, I've been lucky. I've had two jobs, unless you consider mowing grass for my dad being the third job. And I actually love that because when you're making that kind of money, when you're in like seventh, eighth grade, that's pretty good too. Right. Um, but to work at MDNU and have a great job and then to come here and I mean, I've told them it's like, you know, 21 years at one place, I'd love to do 21 years here and then just be done and not have to right. worry about anything else. But a lot of it comes down to people that are above you. Yeah. I mean, when you have good leaders, it makes you want to show up for work. And so, I mean, that's probably something that if you're in a leadership position, you want to try to be that kind of leader because your people will go to war for you if, if they love working for you. Right. hundred percent. You, you, um, so well, first of all, let me tell a quick story. First, let me back up even before that quick story. Thank you. Uh, you didn't have to say all that. Um, I, I appreciate that. And, and as your big brother, I'm super proud of you and always oh, have nice. been uh, in everything that you do. And, uh, I, you know, we watch each other virtually, I guess you'd say on social media. And, uh, you know, I always stay in touch with what you're doing. And, and uh, we'll, we'll touch on our real win before we get off of here. <laughs> I mean, come on. And if Joe White's listening or watching, Joe White needs to hear the, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that at the end. Let's put a pin in that. We'll put that because I'm trying to categorize all the things I want to talk to you about. So, um, so we'll, we'll talk about that at the end, but, but I, no, I, I am super proud of you and, and have always been watching your career develop um, all those things. And, and you didn't have to say any of those things. And, you know, part of that's just, I think Joe White said it, man, that's just, that's just being a good person, you know, um, and, and that's that hopefully, you know, when, when I'm in the grave one day, um, hopefully later than sooner, um, that, that, that will be said of me that that's just the right way to do things. And that's right. the right way to, right way to right. treat people. And, um, you know, Mount Vernon gave me a lot of grace and I'll always be thankful for that as a, as a university and the people around me gave me a lot of grace, um, as I went along. And so, um, those kind words are, are very well received and, and thank you. Um, yeah you know, it, it, it means a lot to, uh, to hear that. I didn't want to pass by that. So, um, uh, thank you for, for what you said, but, um, all right. The, uh, gosh, there's so many different ways that we can go. <laughs> there really is Dave. You, you, you've, here's my thing. Um, I, I believe that, um, it was, uh, uh, the great Carlos Whitaker. I don't know if you know who Carlos is, but Carlos Whitaker once told me, um, standing in Nashville when I asked him, cause he's been involved in so many things and he's done so many things in his life. And I said, Carlos, like, what's the key to life? Like, what, how do you do all that? And he said, you got to step into it. Um, so let me take it there. You have stepped into so many things in your life. Um, so the first off, let me also say that when you were the SID, um, there was this little kid, I came to watch a soccer game or something. I don't remember what we were on campus for, but there was this little guy with me and he was about, I don't know, eight or nine years old. I think I drug him with me. Uh, he happened to be my son. And so I took him with me up to old MVNU and, and we watched something. I don't remember. And you handed him a t-shirt that said MVNU baseball. And, and there's zero chance it would fit now. But that kid's now a <laughs> sophomore and he's playing MVNU baseball. So He's like twice as big as you too. <laughs> Yeah, he is. He's, and he throws a lot harder than I do. So, and he's actually a way better basketball player. But anyway, he's a great athlete. I got that from his mom. And, uh, and, but no, I, I, again, I think what you're going to hear in this podcast is, man, you've planted seeds along the way. That was a seed that you planted and then eventually watered through, you know, connecting with him. You follow him on social media and, and all those things. Uh, now he's at MVNU. And, and so he's playing baseball and, and I, we never knew the day you handed us this little bitty, you yeah. know, kids medium t-shirt that that kid would be on the mound one day from Mount Vernon. So, that's cool. um, so that's very cool. All right. So enough about me and, and him, let's talk about you. So one of the places that you have absolutely just poured into and stepped into is running. Can we talk yeah. about that for a minute? We'll get, sure. let's get back to Donato's, but first let's talk about your running journey because man, that has truly been a journey. You have, walked almost the entire earth or ran I should say. So talk <laughs> to me a little bit about running when you started um yeah let's just talk running for a minute 
Well, what, what's funny is um, you were a runner before I was, and uh, like one point. of your last half marathons at Cap City was probably the day that I decided I needed to start doing this thing. Because I'd gone a couple times and watched, and um, you know, if you go to one of those events, I mean, there's 5Ks everywhere, but when you start to move up to like a half marathon, yeah, that's a big commitment. It's a training right. commitment. If you don't train for it, you're really not going to have fun on race day. Um, but you go to those things and especially you get, to, you go spectate at like mile 11, mile 12, it's getting painful for people. Yeah. And, and yet you'll see people of all ages, all sizes, all shapes, um, just they're out there pouring themselves into it and they have their own story. And, and, and then you start to find out about their stories, whether they're fundraising, whether they're trying to lose weight, whether they just want to be more fit, whether you know, somebody they love passed away and they're doing this in memory of them. And, and it's like, I love great stories. And so you start to see all these great stories unfold and you're like, man, I want to be part of that. Right. Um, and then I also realized for me, um, you know, my job didn't always allow me to take the best care of myself. I mean, I, I never, you know, we could all lose a pound or two here or there, sure. but um, you know, when you're chugging three Mountain Dews a day to stay awake, late at night to get things done, you probably need to make some kind of change. And, yeah. and so I was trying to play basketball a couple of days a week with the coaches and professors, and, and that's all good. Um, you're getting some exercise and you're having interaction with people, but then I, I hurt my wrist. And so I was never a scorer. I was just really tall. So I could get in the way yeah. I could rebound. I couldn't grab the ball cause I hurt my wrist. And so I'm like useless. You might as well put me down at that point. So I figured I've got to do something else in order to stay in shape. And so I, you know, in Mount Vernon, we're, we're lucky we have a rail to trail that it's actually 13 miles in length. So you could run a whole marathon just on the trail. Yeah. Um, and so I started going there. Uh, it's just a little over 10 years ago now. And the first day I was like, well, this will be no problem. I've been playing basketball. I'm just going to run out a mile, run back a mile. And nope. <laughs> I didn't go back for a couple of days because it was not easy. Yeah. Number one, I probably didn't have the right shoes. I just threw whatever old shoes I had on and they're probably yeah. basketball shoes for whatever, whatever I know. But yeah. And then I went back a couple of days later and it was the same older ladies on the trail and, and they're like, you were faster the other day. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> hurt today. And I've got shin splints now just from running one time. And, and right. so then I didn't go back for a while. Cause I'm like, these people are going to make fun of me. And they really weren't, they were just trying to have conversation. Um, but then um, I, you know, I did start going back a little more, a little more. And, and one day I had my headphones mess up and the same song was on repeat. And I didn't realize I didn't turn around. And so I actually ran like five miles one day. I was like, wow, maybe I can do this. And then I, uh, I'd been running just casually for like three months or something. And I signed up for a local race because I thought, well, this could be interesting. And, and I went and all of a sudden, you know, I was like in the top 10 and I thought, you know, then the competitive part of things comes back to you. And, you know, I was tall, so I got to play a lot of basketball. I wasn't any good because I was like a deer on ice. I mean, I, I hadn't grown into my body yet, like in high school and everything. And so it's just, I could go out there and contribute a little bit, but I was never any kind of even mediocre star athlete. But all of a sudden here, I'm having a little bit of success in running. And so it's like, I want to do more of this. And so immediately I signed up for a quarter marathon, the first Emerald City quarter marathon. Um, and then I did the, uh, the Columbus half marathon that first year. And I mean, was under two hours was like 145 or something for the first time I did a half marathon, which, I mean, I put in some training, but not like what I do now. And, and right. so I was hooked. I mean, the competitive part was, I was hooked. I could show up to smaller races and maybe finish in the top three in my age group. And so that was fun. Um, it's not why I do it, but it, it was fun. I mean, it hit the competitive nature of things. And so then as you meet people and you, like we had a Mount Vernon running group that we put together and we would show up every day at the MBNU chapel and we'd do the 5K course. And, you know, whether we're doing it five days a week and then on Saturdays, we'd run a, bit, a little bit longer. And so that second year I signed up and did the Columbus Marathon. And again, did okay for walking the last six miles and eating donuts at aid stations um, <laughs> was under four hours for the first yeah. time for the first one, which was good. And I was hooked and I actually liked the longer distance races. I've done 18 full marathons now in, wow. in 10 years. Um, and I've, 
I mean, I've been fortunate enough to get to do Boston three times. I would have done it a fourth time, but um, was in a car accident that kept me from from doing that one. Um, gotten to do New York City and Chicago. So it's it's been a lot of fun. So in 10 years, I've run somewhere over 22,000 miles. Wow. COVID's been another story. This has been yeah. crazy. For a lot of people, they've kind of, some people have given up on running because there's no races to run right now. Right. Yep. But then you've also seen a lot of people who are either out walking or running because they don't know what else to do. And I'm thinking of all these poor dogs that have gotten walked ragged because their owners are taking them out four times a day. Your dog's probably like, I can't wait till this stops. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. You're right. Um, so like my mileage, I've got now six straight months of over 300 miles in a month, just because wow. you, you don't have all the other obligations or yeah. the other activities. I mean, I don't have a lot of the kid activities to get to go to right now. Right. Um, yep. And you're allowed to be outside. And there was a time where we couldn't do anything inside. And so, you know, I, I've just chosen that to do. And, and it's been fun. Um, you know, you find different virtual challenges. I've actually done two in-person marathons during COVID, which is wow. good. And I've got a 50K coming up here in two weeks. So that, that'll be fun. Uh, so how many miles is 50K? Because I'm not very bright. 31.1. Uh, so, Yeah. <laughs> and, and, oh, and they decided to throw a bunch of hills into that too say that again i'm sorry they decided to throw a bunch of hills in there too like 31 miles wasn't enough perfect have you ever done nashville uh, i have not but i've run a lot of miles in nashville because i helped open our store that's in midtown in nashville so of all the places i've traveled for for donato's uh, nashville has been one of the busiest places for me to go i probably spent 50 nights in nashville during my time at donato's so I think during the last six years, I've probably run a thousand miles in Nashville. And so I've done a bunch of the course. I've met people down there. There's great running groups down there. I'd, I'd like to do it at some point. Um, I know it's challenging because it's hilly and usually they get really bad weather at times because yeah. in the spring it can get, they can get storms and everything, but it's a great city. And I love running in that city, all the bridges and the different yeah. things there. It's, it's a fun city. It's a great marathon and half marathon. I, well, I, I've never done the marathon. I should, let me, I've done the half. Um, I've done it enough times to never want to do it again. And, uh, um, uh, but it, it is a great city. It's very cool. There's a lot of churches and schools down yeah. there. And so they have choirs out, the music. I mean, come on, it's yeah, Nashville, it's right? Nashville. So it's, uh, it's an amazing run, but, but it's either, you're either running up or down most of the time. And most of the time it's up and it sucks. <laughs> Uh, but it's just to be frank, uh, but please do it because it is great. It's Nashville yeah. and, and it's, uh, it's special. Um, yeah. So, but, but so several pounds ago, we used to run into each other at, at five K's like the first on the first and uh, yeah. the half. And, you know, we'd always kind of find each other before the corrals, you know, yeah. kind of loaded up and you were in a corral far further ahead <laughs> than I was <laughs> because my pace is, is nowhere. Well, and now I have no pace anymore, but before, you know, even then, but, but no, it was always great to see you. And, and uh, again, just very proud of you, the dedication it takes um, to in the commitment. Um, like I say, I, I, used to do that and i wish you know i could still do that there's been some challenges there but um you know to be able to get up every morning and have that i think there is a fire that burns inside of you and most people listen some people listen to this may say that is nuts but i think the people that have run understand that there's a fire in there there's something yeah. about crossing that finish line and you said it so well um every race every every race and every person that crosses that finish line has a story and yeah. every story's different, whether it's yeah. they're, they're a, a, a family member, a friend, they're running for something. And that yeah. is, when you go to race day, a lot of times I think if we go and we've never run ever, we stand at the finish line, we're like, these people are crazy. This is stupid. Yeah. Like, I would never do this. Don't ever say that because when you start, there's a reason why you do it. And when you stand at that finish line, you can see tears, you see joy, you know, emotion. For sure you see fight where people are cramped up and, and, and I know that sounds all sounds crazy, but when you know the story behind why they did it, man, that makes, that's powerful. That finish yeah. line at a race is one of the more powerful things. We watch sports on TV. We see a guy hit a home run and you know, his dad passed away, Wh whatever. I mean, we love sports, yeah. right? Uh, the finish line at any race is, um, is that moment for so many people and you can't take it away. You, you right. finished your first marathon, your half, your 5K, your four, whatever, whatever it was, you finished it and no one can ever take that away from you. And the medals don't mean much after right. a while, the right. t-shirts, right. right? I mean, after right. a while, it's like, just throw them away. Yeah. 
but that moment and it never gets old and it's special every time. So, man, I'm really yeah. proud of you and you just continue to pump out races. It's amazing. Well, it, it's fun. And, um, like for me, I think the reason, and for everybody a distance is a different thing. It's a different challenge for different people. And yeah. sometimes your pace makes it different. But for me, the reason I like the marathon is because I'm going to be uncomfortable at some point, like in a 5k, I'm going to be uncomfortable, but it's going to be over pretty quick. Right. Um, because the 5k, you tend to go faster, but in a marathon, you're going to reach a point where your body's going to want to shut down because you can only hold so much fuel. You can only, you know, all those kind of things. And so right. it's trying to figure out how to walk that fine line. And I mean, I think that's what we do in life. It's like, you want to push yourself to be the very best but you got to be careful not to get burned out or not to use it up too quick and to pace yourself and to like, you know, work to reach your goal, but do it at the right pace and know when to push a little harder and, and all those kind of things. And I think that's why I really enjoy the longer distance races. And I learn a little bit more about myself every time and what you're capable of and, you know, and, and while you're competing against other people in those things, it's really always just against yourself. I mean, right. if, if you can run a PR, that's great because it means you got better, but you also are older. So you're never going to be what you were that day. I mean, mm -hmm. you're going to reach a point where you can't go that fast again, but you can, you can still succeed in some way. Like the, the one marathon I did two marathons ago, I actually negative split the thing by over a minute. And so I ran the second half over a minute faster than I ran the first half. And I'd never done that before. And so here I was 17 marathons in, and it wasn't my fastest one, but it wasn't my slowest one either. So it's not like I sandbagged the first half. Right. <laughs> um, right. um, I just really ran a smart race and I, I was proud of that, really proud of that. Um, probably yeah. more proud than like running Boston or something. And this was just a small little race. But um, yeah, I just think you try to learn things about yourself each time. And, and again, it's also all the people that you meet along the way mm -hmm. and, and the friends that you train with. And, and that's been a little bit the hard part during COVID. Um, I went, gosh, I think it was like 30 days totally running by myself. And if you follow me at all, you know that I really enjoy running with people. Like this morning, it was the Delaware Donut Run Club. And we had a dozen people and we all had donuts afterwards. And, and we stayed apart and, you know, yeah. we're, we're doing all those things. But, um, you know, to go 30 days running by yourself, then you're really figuring out if this is something you want to do. Um, and it was all in the dark in Mount Vernon um, because I couldn't go to my gym and shower, which is, you know, one of those things. And so it was a challenge, but it was really good to see people again. I mean, I really miss the hugs that we get to give everybody. I mean, that's been a hard part during COVID is if you're a people person and, and you're just, I mean, you're not even fist bumping, you're not doing anything because right. we're trying to do our part during all this, but that interaction's really missing and that's, it's hard. Yeah. Um, and you, it's, so we, and I know we're on a little bit of a time crunch because you're at work. And so I don't want to take too much time. And I do appreciate any time you gave us. Oh, um, so how do you mix? Um, Cause I want to transition back to Donato's. I want to make sure we give them the time and, and um, you know, how do you mix running with work? Cause I, and I, you get up at crazy times, right? Cause you get that done before you go to work every day and yeah. you don't work in the town that you live in. Right. Right. It's, it's a bit of a, a drive for you. So yeah, you, I mean, I, how, I, how do you mix all that. I live an hour away, so I'm driving an hour to work each way. But what's funny is, you know, when we talked at the beginning, I said that I made the change so I'd have more time back in my life. So even though I live an hour away from work, I still get home sooner than when I lived a mile and a half from work. Wow. And so, so that part's good. I mean, I'm, I'm typically, I can get out of here by 530 and get home kind of thing and have dinner. Um, I'm up early. I mean, I'm usually up at four something on the clock and get out of there and I get my drive out of the way. And so most of the time I'm driving closer to, or running closer to where I work so that the drive's done. I've got a gym that I joined across the street from work. So basically paying for a shower and <laughs> those kind of things. Um, but I feel like when I step into the office first thing in the morning, I'm super energized because I yeah. just ran. I mean, I, I accomplished a lot in that hour or an hour, 10 minutes or whatever. And so I've got all those endorphins and I come in and I feel like I'm able to give my job a lot of benefit because I got up early and ran. Yeah. I won't lie by four o'clock, I'm starting to get sleepy because, okay. Okay. <laughs> but you know, you, you find ways to get through that and everything. But um, one thing with work that's been fun. So in the midst of COVID here, um, 
we've done a lot for different charities and um, healthcare workers, frontline people, that kind of thing. And we were trying to look for different ways to do things. And so I was going to do a virtual challenge where I ran for 24 hours. Um, was trying to do four miles an hour for as long as I could hold out. And it was like four point something so that if you actually did it for 24 hours, you'd do 100 miles. Well, going into that, the most I'd done in a day was 31 miles. So it was going to be a challenge, but it started at, you know, 12 a.m., was going to go to 12 p.m. It was actually the day that Cap City was supposed to be this year in April. And so um, I'm an ambassador for Cap City, and so I needed to run that day anyway. It was weird to not have that race. That's been a race that I've done a bunch. And uh, so I got up at midnight, and there was a bunch of other people virtually doing it, and we were doing it through Zoom. So every hour we would check in on Zoom to see who was still going. So I did it at midnight, 1 a.m., and, and I got through 10 hours. And so I was at 40 plus miles when you add on the point, whatever that we were doing, my stomach was done. I was just, you, you know, when you do those endurance things, your legs could give out on you, but it's more likely gonna be digestive things and things wow. like that. It's just hard to fuel. And so I was at 40 plus miles, I was pretty happy. I mean, I was farther than I could go, but at the same time, I mean, that was 10 hours. And so it was only 10 AM. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, there's all this time left in the day. What? Yeah. <laughs> I hate that I'm done, but I just couldn't get out of the chair to go when the next hour started. And so I ended up taking a nap and doing some things, but to go back. So I told work that I was going to do this challenge and they were all in that they were going to help. And so every mile I ran, they were donating a pizza that I would then deliver to a healthcare worker. And so if I did 100 miles, we were going to donate 100 pizzas. Well, I posted that on social media as well, and people started contributing money towards that. So we ended up having enough money to, to do 600 and some pizzas wow. by, the, by the end of the day. So go back to I'm done with the actual challenge. I'm at 40 some miles. Well, the fundraising part of it didn't matter to the challenge. I just couldn't win the challenge or couldn't get to 100 miles with them but I still had hours in the day that I could do. So I took a little nap and then I went for a walk and I got to like 55 miles um, with the walk. And so that was good. And I was like, hey, I'm getting more pizzas for people. That's 55 people that I can feed. And then all this other money that was coming in. Um, and then I went to sleep again <laughs> and wake up and it's raining and it's like 10 o'clock at night. And I'm like, well, I mean, I did pretty good today. I mean, I could be happy with myself and do that. And one of my friends is like, aren't you going to go back out and get some more? So I, I have great friends because they know when to push the buttons for me. And I said, well, it's raining. And they're like, will you melt? <laughs> and I'm like, no. And yeah. I, looked, I looked over in the corner and um, I saw my Boston jacket from 2018. And that was the year I didn't get a run because a distracted driver had hit me head on earlier in the year. And I ended up having to get cut out of a car. Very fortunate. I mean, and that's probably part of my outlook is just, you know, to come out of that with just a broken foot. I've got three screws and a plate in my left foot now from that, but I didn't get to go to Boston that year. And that was the year, if you remember, that Des Linden wins. Americans never win that race, hardly ever. And right. she wins it because it's horrible weather and it's pouring down the rain. Well, she's from upstate Michigan where they don't have beautiful weather. So she right. just powered through that and did what she needed to do. She just, her her saying is just keep showing up. And she kept showing up that day and she won it. And I, I had gone to Boston that year, even though I wasn't running, um, to cheer some friends on, stood in the rain, watched everything happen. And I'd worn that jacket and it stunk to not be able to run, even though it's horrible weather, you're not going to get a good time. And so I saw that jacket and I was like, I'm going to put that jacket on. I'm going to go out and I'm going to see whatever more miles I can get. Yeah. And I drove over to the NAS to the chapel and I thought, I'll just do the 5k course. I know this in my sleep. And, you know, if I get a few more miles, that'll get me to 58. Um, if I could get to 60. That'd be amazing, whatever. So I've got less than two hours at this point. And I walk a couple steps and I'm like, I think I could run still. And so I start running and it's like, this isn't that bad. I mean, it's pouring, absolutely pouring pitch black. I've got my Knox gear vest on. So I'm lit up. I've got a headlamp. Um, but it felt really good. And yeah. I just kept running and running. I ran by my house. I ran to the other side of town. I'm like, 
I might want to keep tacking on a few more. I might get to 10 here. I might get to six. I, my goal became, could I get to 63, which was when Donato's was found in 1963. And so it's like you use these as athletes know this. you use whatever trick you can to like make yourself do something. I'm looking at my watch. I'm like, I got to be done by midnight for this to count during the 24 hours. I'm like, I wonder if I could push and get a whole half marathon done with this since I was supposed to do Cap City today. Right. And so I've already done 55 miles. I had like an hour, 57 minutes or something to get a half marathon done with 55 miles on my leg. And I made it. I got the whole half marathon done and I wow. actually felt really good. And it was just really cool. And I remember I got done. I'm soaked. I get the stuff off and I sat there in the parking lot in the chapel. and was just like, wow. Yeah. And, and I realized, you know, that was a few more people we got to feed. That's all these people that were donating per mile. They were going to contribute more money because it was per mile. And so we were right. going to just be able to help all these people. And it was just really, it wasn't about anything I did, but because I was doing it for other people, it actually just kept fueling me and let me do more and more that I was capable of, honestly. And yeah. it was just a really cool experience. And I think with running, um, you have those opportunities and, you know, you catch your second wind or you get that runner's high. And that was one of the rare times that I could say I've got that runner's high and it didn't happen until after it was over, but it was just this really cool thing. And it was because I was able to help people, but having a company that I work for that believes in me and says, Hey, go do this. We support you. They've been great about my running here. And they realized that, you know, when I was a field marketing person, I would go to a new city where we were going to get a store and my way to scout out the neighborhood to figure out where we should like market and do things. I would go run around the store and figure out what all little things were there and be like, Hey, we should go do this or that or whatever. So running actually paid off big time for me. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Uh, what an amazing story you have. And, and it's just getting started. I mean, it's just getting started, you know, and, and, and to work for a company that supports you and yeah. a great company, a great local company, which is something else I really wanted to highlight. Donato's is well known for their charitable giving, um, the way that they support local as well as, I mean, across the, you know, the country, as, as you said, you've been in the many cities. Um, they're just a great company. And yeah, and I mean, it was, it was places. I mean, there's one on every corner, honestly, there's a ton and, and I, I'm fans of all of them. Uh, and there's, right. there's one that we're a partner with, you know, where I, where I work during the day that I'm a huge fan of huge. Yeah. Fan. They, they're great. Um, but Donato's is one of those ones that stands out. Like they, they've, they've stood the test of time, as you said, 63, I think you said, yeah, they've been around a long time. Uh, they're, they're very, they've changed the way that people look at pizza in terms of, you know, the thin crust. I remember when I first came to Columbus, I'm like, what the heck is this? Like, and cutting it into party cut instead of the pie shape too. Right. Right. It, that, that, th those are all game changers. And, and, but even then just beyond just those things that they're, you know, they, you know, when you think of a company then they're charitable and they're, they're, they're there almost like a Chick-fil-A type thing where, yeah. You know, you say the brand and you know you're going to get great things, not just the taste of their pizza, but they're great things because of what they do beyond that. And I'll say that about Donato's um, locally, that that's a clear thing. At least, you know, in Columbus, they're very well known, their brand, yeah. because of what they support, what they get behind. So, well, I, th I think it, it all started because when Jim started the company, his whole process was he wanted to be able to take his values to work with him. And, and his friends and people he knew said, you can't go in there and, and do the right thing and necessarily make a profit. And, and so he was like, I'm going to lead with the golden rule. I want to treat people the way that I want to be treated. And if we can't do business that way and I fail, so be it. But, but right. we're going to do things the right way. And so, I mean, one of the things when we open a new store is they get back in the community before they ever sell their first pizza. So they're going to do events where they'll do fundraisers for people and they're going to they're going to do those. They're going to find charity partners right away. That's before they ever make a dime. And, and that's with franchise partners, not necessarily just company people. So we're looking for those kind of people to be part of this. Um, and it's been real evident during COVID. Um, you know, a lot of people have struggled and I'm super proud to work here with the way that they've been super transparent from the top down. Um, our CEO, Tom Kraus, has done just a tremendous job and, and just to watch him firsthand. And, and when there's been other issues come up, um, you know, there's, there's been, you know, societal unrest, different things like that. The first concern is always for the associates and safety. And, and it's not, hey, can we make a few more bucks selling pizzas? We need to stay open longer. No, the first thing they're doing is we got to get people home. We got to, you know, take care of them. Um, 
you know, we wanted to make sure we stayed open during COVID it, it, as an essential business. We were pleading our case all the time because so many people's livelihood depended on it. Sure. And so it's like, we need to stay open so that we can provide jobs for people. Um, and, and we've done that. We've been very fortunate there, but you know, having worked here for this long and, and making the transition, I was a little nervous because it's corporate stuff. I right. mean, we don't talk about corporate stuff here at all because it's family owned. And so it's not like public, but it, it is a corporate business. I mean, it's a big business. Um, but I didn't know how I would fit in coming from MVNU where it's like a family. Well, right. I found a second family here and they very much run it like a family would run it. And their third generation family right now is Jane's son is now working here as well. So um, it, it's just really cool to see. And it, it's not that we're perfect. I mean, none of us are, you and I are, not um, but um, they, they try really hard and they lead with their heart and they care about their people. They care about their customers. They want to do the right thing. And even if we mess up, we want to do the right thing and make it right. And it makes it easy to come to work and it makes it easy to go home at night knowing that that's been the goal all day and we're going to do it again tomorrow. And um, I think COVID has only further enforced that for me. Yeah, that's, that's awesome because there are so many companies that struggled. I think COVID gave every every company a chance to reinvent themselves in many yeah. ways uh, and i think you're seeing it today and a lot of the ones that didn't are already closing their doors as sad yeah. as that is it's not yeah. because they were a bad company it's because they weren't able to reinvent themselves right. um and the fact that they just weren't able to find a way to survive and, and i i hate that i hate driving down the road and watching businesses close um yeah. along with everything else that's come with with covid but um all right shifting quick gears um because i know we got we got a little bit of time um before we get before we get off, I want to make sure we get all the links. So, but before we do that, for Joe White, because I know he's probably going to watch or listen, can you verify that we won an a, a intramural championship? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, there there were pictures on your Instagram today that I sent you. Uh, yeah, def definitely. And you know, I can verify you had hair. I could verify your nickname was Hoops, and. <laughs> All the pictures show you passing, so you were not a scorer, which makes you a great person because people that <laughs> assist others, I mean, anybody can get the glory scoring, but it's it's finding the, the person that's wide open, and you did a great job of that, which <laughs> is why you do a great job with this podcast. What's that? That's why you do a great job with this podcast, because you're finding other people to share their stories. Right. I just make the assist, I, and that... Yeah. I wasn't a good scorer, so, <laughs> but I, Neither was I. <laughs> and I think what, what, it was pretty funny. I didn't realize we were keeping stats all year, uh, 1.8 points a game, which, <laughs> which was awesome. But the, the assist mark column was missing. And that's the one that was a big one. And I remember actually in that game, um, true story, Jamie Perosic, I think I hit a, I think I made a pass. I did hit one three in that game. Cause I think I had nine points according to your score sheet. I don't remember yeah. the other points. I do remember a three cause I couldn't shoot for if my life depended on it. Uh, but somehow I made a three. Um, but I, I remember I, for some reason, I remember the number of six, I was 21 assists. Uh, it was a, it was a, it was a lot. And most of the pictures are me passing <laughs> well, yeah. cause yeah. I couldn't score. So everybody else was, and, and there's one where you were actually, and I'll put all these on the blog post so people see it. Cause they know what we're talking about. But um, I remember at one point I, I made a pass and Perosic, it was, either Pope, I think Perosic and Gregory were the two refs. I don't know why I remember this. I can't remember what I Horrible ate. Horrible refs. I do remember, <laughs> but, but I think, one of the two said, man, you trying to break some kind of assist record? And I don't know why I remember that, but I do. But anyway, great time. Um, it was a great group of guys. And when you sent the picture, again, it'll be in the blog post. When you sent the picture, just a great group of guys. And yeah. we had a lot of fun and yeah. um, great memories. So, okay. And again, it was when we were freshmen and you were an upperclassman. And it just kind of showed the kind of person you were. Because you could have gone and played. I mean, you had a lot of other friends you could have played with. But yeah you kind of enjoyed us squirrely freshmen. We probably made you laugh. And <laughs> Well, I, I recruited the number one recruiting class. I was like Calipari you go. bringing it into Kentucky, you know, like I told Joe White. So, there you go. <laughs> anyway, all right, before we get off of here, what are all the links? Uh, be, and, and when I say links, not just, you know, Donato's, but you have a blog, you have an Instagram, a Twitter. Um, and then how about this? What is there a way, give me this too, give me a way that people can contact you because I think somebody may hear this and you never know, you and I both been in, in, in that world, yeah. I'm much shorter than yours, but um, if I was 
you know what, I, I'm afraid to start running or I want to start a journey. Oh, yeah. I want to start this or, you know, I've always thought about walking a marathon or a half marathon yeah. or whatever it might be, whatever that I've is. I've done that too. <laughs> right. I think we all have at some point, right? So um, what, give me a way they can contact you, yeah. reach out and say, hey, you know what, I, I'm interested. And knowing that you're not going to give judgment you're not yeah. going to say, well, here's my time. Where's yours? You're not going to, no, do you're going to, you're going to give them the advice to say, just start. Right. Yeah. I mean, um, so what are all those? Probably, probably the thing I like most is new runners because yeah. there's so much upside for people. It's like, it's just exciting for me to talk to people who don't know it all already. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Too many people know it all already. <laughs> right. Right. Um, yep. No, but, but for me, probably the best way to connect with me, I'm, I'm most active on Instagram. So it's DP on the go and there's an underscore under each of those different phrases. But I think if you type it in, you'll find it. Um, you'll see running pictures and sunrises and uh, that, that'll be me. Um, and then my blog is dponthego.wordpress.com. Um, you could find the story about the accident and some of the stuff I've had to do to come back from that. And you'll probably see me talking about my rogue racers teammates and, and people that much faster than me that inspire me every day. And, and just some of the things I, I've been very fortunate to get to do a lot of unique things. And um, yeah. I mean, for me, it's more about telling the story of other people, because as you would probably say, if you can surround yourself with all these great people, you're going to get to do some fun stuff Absolutely. and they're going to make you way better if you're yep. around them. So yep. I, that's just what I try to do is just yep. try to be around really good people and they're going to rub off on me and I'm going to try to learn things from them. So. Yep. hundred percent. So I will put all the links in this blog post uh, for those that are driving down the road or listening or driving or running, listening to this. Um, I'll, I'll put all the links in the post to so just go to my, my site and you'll see all of them. But um, man, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your friendship all these years. Yeah. Um, I know we've, we've watched each other's families grow up and watched each other grow up. Uh, you know, thank God again for social media because yeah. it's been wonderful to stay connected. Um, someday I might get back to one of those corrals uh, if not, I'm usually outside the corral cheering on my, my wife. <laughs> We're volunteering. I know your family has volunteered at several races. Yeah. I've seen them that way and everything yep. too. So Yeah, we'll, we'll be there somehow. I'll try to be there somehow. So, I just look uh, forward to having races again. That'll be nice. nice. I hope so. I hope so. And, and I hope um, even, our, even our family, uh, free family turkey trot that we do every year, we've had to do virtual. So uh, yeah. we're going to have to put that, you know, just to be a part of the solution because the sooner we can all get through this, the better. So, yeah. but, uh, but man, I appreciate you. I appreciate yeah. your time. And, uh, um, you know, it, it's great talking to you. It's great reliving some great memories. And, and uh, I thank you again for your kind words. I appreciate it. No problem. Thanks, Aaron. All right, man. Great to have you on. Talk to you soon.